it happened. It's true. It happened historically. Um, and, and I don't know if you know this, but I'm, I'm, I'm reading this book on the formation of the American government. And the most central figure to the American government is Moses. If you go to the Supreme Court, you'll see Moses chilling on a little throne there and the Ten Commandments. And, and so he's there. And so he is, believe it or not, the most central figure to the formation of the American government. And, and the story or the Exodus narrative is a story that people have embraced as their own story throughout history. For example, the pilgrims were leaving uh, England and they were crossing the sea. And so you have these people and they embodied this story. And from their own mind, they were like Moses going through the Red Sea. They were like the children of Israel going to the promised land. And then you have in the American, you know, you have the, 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 the African, uh, the, the black story of America where they identify with the Exodus because they were, they were taken from their own people. They were enslaved. They, they experienced gross injustice. And the effects of that injustice are still here today. Whether you believe it or not, whether you, I'm not talking about wokeness. I'm just talking about the effects of those generational things are still here. So the, 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 the black people, the African-Americans in America also identified with the Exodus narrative in, in terms of a people who, are, who were brought to freedom. And you have many of the old spiritual songs that were written and sang, and they identified Harriet Tubman. She, she was someone who, uh, she was like a black woman Moses who literally took people out of slavery. So you have this exodus. Now, as a Christian, we also embrace this story in this sense of, in this sense, we were once slaves to sin, right? And so you did bad things. And how do I know you were a slave to sin? Because when you did bad things, you liked them. <laughs> when you become Christian, you do bad things and you feel bad. And I know because I tried it. And, 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 and so it's just like you have no fun doing things that used to be fun. And that's because your spirit is alive to God and now your conscience is activated and you know that doing those things is not pleasing to God and it's dehumanizing to you and it's hurtful to you and the relationships that you value the most. It hurts those relationships the most. And so you see this brokenness and you experience this brokenness. And so even as Christians, we look back at the Exodus in the sense of we were once in the land of Egypt, in the house of bondage. We were once slaves to sin. We once lived in the vanity of our own mind, doing the things that we thought were good and doing whatever it is that we wanted to do. And so now as Christians, hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> so hopefully, you know, Hopefully, <clears throat> you're living in the freedom that the Holy Spirit provides. Because it says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or there is freedom. So if you're a Christian and you're living in bondage, here's the good news. I got good news for you. You don't have to. Now, if as a Christian, you still want to have a P.O. box in Egypt... Well, I guess you can have one, but every time you visit that P.O. box, it, it will not be well, and it will not go well for you, and, and it will be very frustrating, and, and it, won't be, it won't feel good, it won't be exciting, uh, it, it'll be difficult, and you will not get the satisfaction that you desire. Thank you, sweetheart. It's not good that man should be alone. So... Um, <laughs> she's like making the world spin here. So thank you. Uh, anyway, so God's design, right, is for freedom. I, I said this 50 times, you're ready, but the Lord gave you a break from me, but now I'm back. God's desire and his design is freedom. God is not a God that forces you to love him. He gives you a choice. But let, let me just give you the example. When Moses said to the people, listen, 
You've got to put the blood over the doorpost. Remember, that was the last thing I, I, I was sharing in, the, in this narrative. So Moses puts the, so the children of Israel slay the lamb, put the blood over. And the first thing that they learn, even before they get out of Egypt, is that when I obey God, I'm covered. When, when I am obedient to God, I will not be put to shame. When I am obedient to God, there is a delineation between me and the other peoples of the world. I want to be honest with you, and maybe I'm throwing the ball in the end zone for some of you, but there should be a serious delineation between you and peoples of the world. You should be in the same situation as people, but completely different in that situation because greater is he who lives in you than he that lives in the world. So there should be something real different deep on the inside of you that when other, other people are going crazy and afraid and, and anxious and stressed, there's something about you where you're anchored because of Jesus and you're free and people look at that and go, there's something different about that person. And, and, and you notice that, this is how you, sometimes you notice that in funny things. You, you're getting ready to board a plane. And everyone's anxious and, and, and they're pushing and, and you're just standing there smiling. Happy with your headphones on. <laughs> everyone. And, and, and you're happy and people are looking at you like, why aren't you anxious? Like, why aren't you fighting? I mean, I'm just not like that. I just, I used to be like that. It's just not in there. That's <laughs> like, you know. You can, and, and, and here's the thing. If I get cranky with the stewardess or, or with the people that let me into the plane, does that make the plane get there any faster? No, it doesn't. It just ruins everyone else's experience because of my crankiness. So instead of being cranky, why not just have peace, right? So what I'm talking about is beyond the external situation. I'm talking about something deep within you. So now, the, today's message is law and order and Weren't you on law and order? Yes. Yeah, so the t today's message is Jim. So <laughs> I preached Jim today. No, I'm just playing. So law and order it is not about control and manipulation. It's about blessing and freedom. And so um, I, let me just say, when, when I receive you know, an email, hey, I just sent you $2,800. I did not receive $2,800 for clean water from someone who is in bondage. I did not receive that from someone who is anxious. I did not receive that from someone who is worried. I received that from what I call a freed man. Right? So now, here's, here's what I'm saying to you. It's not about money. But if you are free and you are blessed, and you live differently than, than, than the world around you, now you're in a power position. You're in a power position. Some people cannot even imagine giving $2,800. They can't even conceive it. It, 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 it. Because money has, is so attached to them, they are so attached to it, that they could not even let that go. But this guy, he doesn't care. He, he's a freed man. So, so he can be a part of God's plan. When you're a freed man or a freed woman, you, you can then be a part of God's plan. And, and this is uh, far beyond money. And In fact, today is not even about money. And most of you are actually pretty generous. When, when, I, when I talk to other pastors and stuff, uh, you are very generous people. We have other issues, but you guys are very generous people. So now, this is, this, is, this is important because God wants you free and blessed. I, I, I don't know if you, if you get this, maybe, this is good news. For, I mean, to me, this is good news. Like, if you're talking to me and you're telling me the guy who has spoke the world into existence, the guy who generously gave his best, his one and only son, uh, the guy who hates sin so much that he was willing to die himself so I wouldn't have to live in it. If you're telling me that that person wants me to have eternal life, have joy, have peace, be free, and be blessed, to me that's good news. I mean, if you have people that love you and stuff and, and they really want you to do good and they have the power to make you do good, th those are nice people to have around. 
So imagine how much more God, who is the creator and sustainer of all things, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, who says, son, I want you to do good. I want you to be well. I want it to be well with your soul. I'm talking about prosperity of soul, not just situations, because there's people who have prosperity of money and jump off a bridge. I'm talking about on the inside, well. And we have a misconception because of the abuse of authority and because of the lawlessness in our society that somehow law and order is a bad thing. But law and order is actually the thing that facilitates freedom and blessing. I'll give you an example. You go to a country with, that is lawless um, and, and, and it is poor, it is impoverished, you have a little earthquake. A little earthquake kills 230,000 people because they have no building codes, because they're poor, and 230,000 people die in 30 seconds where the same type of earthquake can hit another place that has prosperity and has some sense of law and order and 100 people die. So, so, so the idea of having no law and no order is demonic. That's, in fact, let me tell you this, that is exactly what hell is like. So, anyway, you first have to understand that God wants what's best for you. He, he really, really does. And it's really hard to trust someone if you're not convinced that they really want what's best for you. But when you know someone really wants what's best for me, it becomes easier to trust someone like that. And, and one of the things that, that it does is that, you know, we all have these little walls and filters, right? And, and filters are like, I'm filtering things through my pain or my experience or my desires or what I want or what happened to me or what didn't happen for me or what I'm hoping will happen to me or all those things. I'm filtering through all these filters. So you have filters and then you have walls and walls are not really good. Filters are healthy, but walls are like, I've been hurt. So now I'm isolating myself. And, and so the wall that you think is going to protect you is actually going to be the thing that doesn't let good people in to help you. And you're actually isolating yourself and it's actually a form of punishment in the modern and in the ancient world and you're punishing yourself because you have a trust issue because you trusted someone that wasn't trustworthy you were put to shame and now you're stuck with shame and you're stuck with pain and now you're like I don't know who to trust when if you have God and if you have good people in your life, mature people in your life, people who want the best for you it's a no brainer to trust them because they're going to help you I don't know if you're with me. So what I'm trying to say to you ultimately in one sentence is God loves you and he's not cranky and he's not in a bad mood and he, he cares for you and he really does want what's best for you. Even if what's best for you doesn't feel like it's best for you right now. You know, it's like as a parent, I have to decide, I'm responsible to God to decide what is best for them. And sometimes what is best for them is not what they feel like doing. But I don't really care what they feel like doing because I'm responsible for them. I don't know if you know this, but when you, began, when you were born again and you came out of Egypt and you came out of being a slave to sin... And you came out from the grip of Pharaoh, out from the house of bondage, out from the land of Egypt, out from Pharaoh's quota. When you came out from that, now as God being your father, he assumes moral responsibility for you and says, that's my son, that's my daughter, I'm going to take care of them. But for you to receive that care, you've got to listen. It's not his fault if you don't listen. So now... When you are assured that what God wants for you is good, it helps you trust and obey him. So now let me just establish a few things before I get into the scripture. The, the, the law, God, uh, before he required anything from his people, he delivered them and proved that he was powerful 
and trustworthy. But the people to get delivered had to obey him. So they didn't earn their deliverance, but they participated with it when they put the blood over the doorpost. They participated when he said, eat. They participated when they burned the remains of it. All through the, let me say one thing to you. All through the Old Testament, you have what is called a holocaust or a burnt offering. That's really what it's called in, in Hebrew. A burnt offering. And, and one of, one of the, the revelations of a burnt offering, one time I was so crazy, I didn't even know it was illegal, but I was so crazy that I took money one time to prove a point to people and I lit it on fire and burned it. I didn't know that was a federal offense or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just crazy trying to prove a point. Yeah. <laughs> so that's right. That's another message, Jim. <laughs> you want to hear one of my... So, 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 but the point is, the, the, the purpose of burning... Imagine I walk outside and I light someone's pickup truck on fire. They might want to kill me. Right? Well, when you, when you light a goat, when you eat a little bit of the goat and you light the goat on fire, and, and, you, and it's to break your attachment with mammon... We could save little goat, little, little Timmy, and put Timmy in the freezer. No, no, no. Burn the whole thing. Learn to trust God as your provider. See, every time and every week, God is confronting a spirit of mammon in his people. Every week. The children of Israel had to bring their offering. They take the grain, throw it up in the air. It's like, I could have ate that, God. That's, that's the Eve offering. And, and then we got the burn offering. I could have ate that. Burn it to the ground. Uh, I, I want you to learn to trust me. Oh, Lord, well, we can save the edges of our field. No, 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 those are for the fatherless. I've, I have provided, uh, I have commanded generosity because I have given you prosperity. And, and, and in every way, God is breaking the attachment to mammon in people. Because you cannot serve the kingdom of God and mammon. That's why sometimes it's so hard for a believer to break through. When you serve the devil, you had a surplus. Now you're serving the Lord. You're trying to honor God. And now you're sweating. Why? Because God is going to break the trust in mammon. That's true. Now, and, and when, that, when that is broken off your life, you, you see it differently. You see things differently. So, so God is always confronting anything that would try to hold us hostage. So if it's sexual morality, if it's fear, if it's um, offense, Whatever it is, anything that would try to hold you hostage and hold you back from who he is and everything that he has for you, he is at war with that. So if you put your sexuality before God and you say, I'm not going to honor God with my body. I'm going to have sex outside of marriage. I'm going to cheat on my wife. I'm going to be sleeping with somebody else's wife. Whatever you say, God is at war with the thing that you put in front of him. If you say, I'm not going to tithe to God. I can't afford it. I don't trust God. God is at war now with your finances because you don't trust him. You say, oh, I really care about my mother-in-law. I just want to please her. Hopefully she'll love me one day and approve of me. Now God is at war with your mother-in-law because you're putting your mother-in-law's opinion before God. God is at war with whatever you will put in between you and him because he loves you that much. He's a jealous God and his jealousy is not out of insecurity. It's out of holy love because he has and is and knows what's best for you. And I'm telling you, what's best for you is better than what I want for you or what you want for you. And what's best for me is better than what I want for me. So, so but that is, that is love. That's love. Anyway. God gives his people a law before land so that they will know how to act when they get into the land. Did, did you notice that? So, so he... He takes them out of bondage, and before he requires anything of them, before he says, you got to tithe, you got to rest, you got to do this, you can't, before he tells them all you can and you can and this and that, he sets them free. Because you can't require anything from someone who's not free. If you're in bondage as a Christian, I can't depend on you. You can't even depend on yourself. 
<laughs> you know, so, so now if you're going to put something before you and God, you're only as dependable as what you worship. So now uh, the law is about freedom and blessing. See, God is saying, I want my people out. He looks at a bunch of slaves and goes, that's my army. That's my nation. That's the kingdom of priests. God is always looking to and speaking to the potential of his people. You, we can be all beat up and, and worked over by Pharaoh. And God's like, oh, I don't want you anymore. And, I'm like, and, and God is always saying, he's always speaking to who you're becoming. You have 400 years of slaves, and God goes, I want to turn these people into a kingdom of priests. I mean, God is really, I mean, very, very generous uh, in, in what he takes and what he makes. You know? And, and I want to say one thing to you. You have to value today. I, I don't have tomorrow. I may not have tomorrow. The deacon may lead the mission trip. You know, I, I'm just joking, but all we have is today. Now, the value of something is determined by who made it, right? This is the day that who has made. The Lord has made. Let us what? Rejoice and be glad in it. So the, the value of something is determined by the maker when they put their stamp on it. Boom. So today was made... For me, by God. And I'm going to take it and I'm going to make the most of it. And God's, God's vision for today is freedom and blessing and refreshing. Now, the promise, and we're going to get into this in a minute, is victory over enemies. That sounds good. I don't know what you're battling. Everyone has a battle. Victory, this is our promise. I don't care the enemy. Victory over enemies. Could be depression, anger, suicide, immorality, fear, lust, money issues, family issues, feelings issues, all types of issues. God's vision is not determined by the issue, but it's determined by what he said out of his mouth. He said to Moses, my presence will go with you, and I'm going to give you rest. He is headed for straight conflict. He is headed. There are seven demonic nations that are occupying land. God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. In the midst of a conflict, in the midst of war, in the midst, I will go with you and I will give you rest. We don't fight, we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. If you're gonna run, Heidi Baker says you gotta run. If you're gonna run with Jesus, you gotta learn to drink. Yeah, you gotta learn to drink. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to keep running, you better learn how to drink while you run. You, you got to learn how to pace yourself and not sprint and destroy yourself because you have 22 more miles to go. We just got started. So you have to learn how to pace yourself, but the promise is victory. So before they walk into the land, before they see the size of the enemies, before they see the size of their house that the enemies is occupying before they see vineyards that they didn't plant, and before they see the houses that they didn't build that God already said is theirs, God is saying, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Do you know that only two of those people that he said that to went and had rest? Only the people, Joshua and Caleb, out of three million people, only two people out of three million people had the right perspective and believed God. I don't know who's coming with me, but I'm, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. I believe that. So, watch. Exodus 20. 
And God spoke all these things, saying, I am the Lord of God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. The first issue is nothing between you and I. I was sitting down with a young man, and he was having some turbulence. And I said, let me just tell you one thing. You have to protect the relationships that God gave you because the relationships that God gave you are the vehicle to you becoming and getting where you're going. And if you don't protect those relationships, if you let things come in between those relationships, you won't get where you're going because God will always give you an upgrade on a relationship before you get to where you're going because the relationship prepares you for where you're going. Because you have to hang out with people that have a mentality that is preparing you for where you're going. The best thing that you can do is shake things and people loose. You cannot disciple someone who doesn't want discipline. The best thing you can do for someone like that is live your life and, and see them in seven years and, know, and go, man, in seven years, you, you came a long way. Yeah, let me tell you how, let me tell you who. Not hanging around with people that are not going. I'm not hanging around with nobody that's not going anywhere. Nobody. I'll minister to you. I'll wash your feet. I'll give you water filters. I'll hug you, love you, pray for you. I'll anoint your head with oil. But I am not hanging out with people that are not going places. In the kingdom. I'm not talking about to be something. So now, the law is the thing that facilitates... God's will for his people. God, the first thing is if anything is coming in between you and I, we've got a problem. That's a problem. The, the, the most beautiful thing about my relationship to my wife is its exclusivity. That is the value. God's priority, his number one priority is your purity. Everything else is off the table if there's not trust here. And if, you, if you've misbehaved, you know, God can heal you. But that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a long road. And God is saying, look, I, I want faithfulness between my people and I. I, I want to have loving kindness and, and tender mercies. And I, I, want it, I want it to be good. I want it to be peaceful, you know? Okay. You shall have no other gods before me. You should not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath. You should not bow down to them nor serve them. Listen, whatever you serve, you worship, and whatever you worship, you serve. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. You see that? It's alive and well in our country. But showing mercy to thousands, look at that. Very merciful. Showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandment. But look at how God interprets those who disobey him. I'm a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. You see that? Sin is personal. If you cheat on your wife, you're not just cheating on your wife. That is a personal offense against God. If you live in immorality... If you live with greed, if you live with even fear, that is a personal offense to God. And God's interpretation is that you hate me. Until sin becomes personal, you will not get free. Listen, I'm I'm sorry. I got to tell you something about sin for a second. We are in a generation of people that would not call sin, sin. And instead of saying you need to repent, they say you need therapy. You probably need both. But I would start with repenting. I don't remember the last time I saw someone on the altar weeping broken over their sin. I see people, uh, I don't like, I'm leaving the church. I don't like the pastor. Uh, I don't like the building. I'm leaving. How about you not like sin? How about you leave that? How about you leave gossiping? How about you leave complaining about something that you don't intend to do anything about? How about you leave lukewarmness? 
Why don't you divorce that? So sin is an offense to God. And uh, you know what offense is? It's a offense. And it brings distance and it separation. And it keeps people out and it, and it also keeps people in. Offense is the bait of Satan. Do you know how many destinies in the kingdom of God are robbed by offense? By misunderstanding? By unverbalized expectations that are completely delusional? So now, showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments, did sound like Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my... There you go. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him who guiltless, who takes the Lord in his name in vain. Watch this, verse uh, 8. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day it is the Sabbath of the Lord, of. Do you know what of is? My son, let me tell you, he's, he's of. <laughs> he is of my loins. <laughs> in other words, whew, he came from me. The Sabbath is of the Lord. It's not about law. It's not about legalism. It's not even a, about a specific day. It's about a person. What, watch, I'm, I'm going to track this. This is, this is something within our culture. This is one of the things that Pharaoh's economy is at war with. And I'll tell you why. Pharaoh's economy wants to send you an email and ruffle your feathers on Sunday afternoon while you're watching football relaxing to get you bent out of shape about Monday. And Pharaoh wants to bother you while you're out to dinner with your wife on Friday because something bad is going to happen on Tuesday. And you got to worry about it all weekend because Pharaoh wants your heart and your mind. And so we live in a boundaryless society where if I text you, I told my pastor this once, I don't know if he appreciated it, but I said I grew up with a cell phone from the time I was in ninth grade. So that's a long time, 15, 17, 18 years, now it's more. It's a long time. So I had a cell phone in my pocket. So when I text you, I expect you to text me back right away. <laughs> now you grew up, you grew up with a phone and someone leaves a message and you call them back two days later. So we have a generational gap here and through communication, we're going to, we're going to, and, and, and that, that's helpful when you are communicating with people through different generations, right? And the, the point is not, did he get back to me right away? The point is that do we have a mutual understanding of how we perceive the world? Because some people think if you don't text them back right away, it's offensive. Because that's because we live in a society with no boundaries and everyone expects an instant response. And honestly, not everything requires an instant response. But this is the way that Pharaoh is very demanding. And Pharaoh is like, you know, Americans go to Afghanistan, we got thrown out of there. But before, we had a program called Hearts and Minds, where you would be in the community trying to build a bridge to the community to help the community understand, hey, we're just here so the Taliban doesn't rape you and kill you. I mean, we're, we're actually not that bad. And, and so they had this thing called Hearts and Minds. Well, guess who is after Hearts and Minds in reality? Pharaoh. Pharaoh wants the heart and the mind. He doesn't just want your labor. He wants your life. He, he wants to occupy space in your life. So now, the Sabbath day is actually a day to say, Pharaoh, you're not in charge. And you're not in control. And it's a reminder every single week that you used to live under the grip of Pharaoh, but now you no longer live under the grip of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh no longer has permission to jurisdict your schedule. One of the most powerful things you can do, let me show you. I don't know if I should do this. This is, can I show you one of the most liberating things that you can ever do? Watch this. My, it doesn't even want to let me. You see that? It's questioning my allegiance to my decision. Sure, 
It's questioning my allegiance. Pharaoh. Yes. I hope it doesn't. The last thing we need is the cops here. So, so anyway, that, do you know how powerful that is? I have a permanent thing on. My notifications are permanently off. You know what that means? I'll look at my phone when I want to look at it. You know how liberating that is? You know what I did to Pharaoh? <laughs> because he wants the heart, the mind. The, 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 you know how much better you sleep? You take your phone, you put it away from your reach, and you just put it just, just a little outside of your reach. Like, I guarantee you, you sleep better. 